Dear doctors, dear eye specialists, we would like to thank you very much for accepting our invitation for this webinar on photobiomodulation for the treatment of dry AMD. Please allow me to introduce myself to you. My name is Attila Kaplanzi and I'm the sales director of Lumithera Europe. I do apologize that I don't speak Norwegian. Now, with this webinar, we would like to offer you a scientific platform for the exchange of information and knowledge, which you can use later to the benefits of your patients. Therefore, we are very happy to welcome two speakers, Dr. Oregon Utheim and Dr. Clark Tedford. Dr. Utheim is an ophthalmologist at the private institute Oyese Helse Kliniken in Oslo. She was the first clinician in Scandinavia to establish Valeda treatments already in January 2020. In the second part, Dr. Eugen will share with us her experience with photobiomodulation using the Valeda light delivery system. Dr. Clark Tedford is president and CEO of Lumitera. He worked for many years in the field of degenerative eye disease, brain diseases, and for more than 10 years, he has been working in the degenerative area and with photobiomodulation and later with ophthalmology. Dr. Clark will talk in the first part about the scientific background of photobiomodulation, the mechanism of action, and he will update us about the latest status of ongoing and future clinical trials. Dr. Clark graduated in neuropharmacology at the University of Iowa. This event should be as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, please write them down below in the section question and answers. Now, Clark, would you please start with the first part, please? Absolutely, Attila, thank you for the introductions. And Eugen, it's a pleasure again to be uh, sharing the uh, uh, podium with you. Um, for today, the agenda, is I'll spend briefly a little bit on Lumithera, photobiomodulation, uh, the mechanisms of action, and how we created the multiple wavelength Valeda light delivery system. Most importantly, I think today, we wanna speak about our pivotal US trial, the LightSight 3 study. We've now obtained the 13 month data, which is the primary, which was met in terms of improvement in best corrected visual acuity. And we're going to talk about some of the top line results from that study. We'll also be able to talk about a study we finished uh, about uh, six months ago called the electrolyte study, uh, where we tested PBM with ERG to show improvement in retinal ganglion function. <clears throat> when I'm finished, we'll turn it over to Eugen so she can provide some of her experience in, in patient case uh, review uh, of the Lalita light delivery system. We'll leave time at the end for discussion and questions and uh, appreciate everybody's attendance uh, this evening. So the Lumithera vision is to create a treatment that is non-invasive using photobiomodulation to improve visual function, hopefully stop or slow progression of debilitating eye disease and prevent vision loss and blindness. The company was founded in 2013. I'm one of the founders of two eye doctors and two engineers. And the idea was to create a light-based photobiomodulation approach to degenerative eye disease. Photobiomodulation is also known as low-level light therapy. It's a medical technology that continues to grow in which exposure to specific wavelengths typical in the visible to near infrared are used to stimulate cellular function that can lead then to beneficial clinical outcomes. PBM is being used in a variety of therapeutic areas. It's approved in arthritis and other skeletal muscle areas. It's used in sports medicine. Uh, if the uh, athletes have uh, tweaked their knee or ankle to recover quicker, it's used in diabetics to stimulate a wound repair in open wounds. <coughs> It's also being advanced to protect against radiation damage and, and cancer, such as oral mucositis. And so it's continuing to be expanded. There's probably about um, two to 3,000 articles that are coming out on a routine basis in various therapeutic areas with photobiomodulation. 
multiple clinical trials are being uh, uh, created in various areas, and the devices are becoming somewhat physician-specific. <clears throat> in our case, uh, photobiomodulation is targeting a mitochondrial enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase. And this enzyme is critical in the electron transport. It's number four of five enzymes. They're involved in generation of stored energy. Mitochondrial cytochrome C oxidase tends to diminish over time and ultimately can trigger cell death or apoptosis. It's a key regulatory then in metabolic activity for the cells and high energy demanding cells like neurons and retinal cells tend to be susceptible to diseases as we get older. Hence the degenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and obviously in the retinal area, AMD and other degenerative uh, eye diseases. The uh, cytochrome C oxidase has been shown to absorb two wavelengths. One, a very band, broad band around 850 or near infrared, and another one at around 670 or 660, which is far red. And both of those absorption spectrums, you see an increase in cytochrome C oxidase activity and an increase in ATP generation. What we've created is the Valeta Light delivery system. It's the first and only approved treatment for dry age-related macular degeneration using photobiomodulation. It was CE marked in late 2018, and the first devices in Europe started to treat patients in about second quarter of 2019. To date, we've treated over 4,500 patients. Um, the device is in now in over 100 different retinal centers across Europe and uh, in select countries in Latin and South America. We have uh, created this multiple wavelength system uh, through multiple clinical trials. The treatment is very simple. Uh, the treatment um, uh, parameters are set based on our clinical trial designs. Uh, the treatment can be delivered in less than five minutes per eye. We typically do uh, one, one eye first and then the other eye, so both eyes can be treated in less than 10 minutes. There's no pupil dilation that's required. In fact, some of the wavelengths are used in skeletal muscle that can penetrate the skin and muscle, and we can actually close the eye and the patient then can see the, the wavelength through the eyelid, but it's very relaxing for the patient. They don't have to be forced to keep their eyes open. We do flexible nine sessions over three to four weeks, typically no more than three a week. And if you miss one, come in on the fourth week. And that provides an upregulation of the pathway and sustained benefits. And so right now in Europe, we're looking at patients coming in for retreatment around four to six month intervals. And we'll show some of the clinical data to support that. The mechanism, as we've shown and alluded to earlier in the slides, are targeting this uh, enzyme cytochrome C oxidase, which is shown on the left in this cartoon. And the two wavelengths are absorbed by two different metallo uh, components, copper A and copper B, that help drive the reduction of oxygen to water and the restoration of the proton pump. This proton gradient is used by the next time ATP synthase to create stored energy. And so two of the wavelengths reflected very closely related to being able to activate the two substrates for cytochrome C oxidase activity. A third wavelength 590 or far yellow was inserted because of its ability to inhibit VEGF expression in cellular works and retinal epithelial cells. It also improves phagocytosis and we felt that this would be useful in removing some of the uh, deposits of lipofusion that we see as part of the disease. Currently, Valeda has gone through multiple clinical trials. In 2021, three clinical trials read out positive data. Our European post-marketing study finished and showed an improvement in BCVA, as well as other uh, key components that we'll talk about today. Um, in addition to that, the electrolyte study, which we'll talk about today, completed showing improvement in retinal ganglion function after uh, uh, one round of PBM treatment. Early work by one of our German KOLs showed that in patients with good vision and DMA, we can reduce central retinal uh, edema. And that was presented at last year's ARVO meeting and is being written up for publication. But we're, today we're going to focus mainly on the US LightSight 3 pivotal study. 
It's a sister study to our European study, and we've now reached the 13-month endpoint, which is a primary endpoint for efficacy, and we have top-line data. We, in addition, have other studies that are ongoing, and we can briefly talk about that during the Q&A. So to give you an update on the top-line safety and efficacy data at month 13 in Light Site 3, we enrolled 100 subjects across 10 top retinal centers in the U.S. Stanford University, New York Eye and Ear, Duke University, we're all uh, contributing universities as well as several uh, private retinal centers as well. These top 10 centers, you may know, they're all top uh, research centers and uh, retinal specialists that uh, are involved in not only uh, device, but also many drug studies. We enrolled 148 eyes and 100 subjects of intermediate dry AMD. <clears throat> The study design was a double mask, randomized, sham controlled parallel groups multicenter study to assess safety and efficacy of photobiomodulation in intermediate patients with dry age related macular degeneration. The inclusion criteria were patients had to have some vision loss from 2032 to 2100 and no central GA in the central fovea or central macula, one millimeter. The patients were randomized into two groups, either the PBM with the active three wavelengths or a sham, which went through the same four minute procedure, but the fluence was reduced 50 to 100 X reduced in the 590 and 660 and the near infrared was turned off. So it is a lower dose. It's not completely inactive. It's more like an active control. <clears throat> the patients were randomized two to one in PBM to sham and they received treatments every four months. So they went through four rounds of treatment before the month 13 analysis. They're continuing now. And uh, the last two series are gonna be followed for safety out to month 24. We're happy to say that about 38 patients have already completed the two year uh, study. And uh, the top line data is now being unmasked and we're gonna provide you with some of that information. The baseline characteristics were 148 eyes, PBM to sham, two to one, predominantly Caucasian and female at 68%. The mean age of the patients were about 75 years of age and the time from diagnosis was just under five years. In the United States, arid supplements are uh, predominant. And in this case, in the study, about 86% of the patients were on arid supplements. We did stratify, so the centers were balanced between patients that either were on or were not on arid supplements. The patients started out with a pretty good letter score. So these patients had either 70 to 70.7 letters uh, in either the sham or the active group. And that's just about a little better than 2040 vision. The majority of these patients were cat arids category three patients or intermediate dry AMD patients. <clears throat> The compliance, despite the fact that this was done throughout COVID was very high with 80%, 87% of the eyes making the 13 month and 78% of the sham eyes meeting the 13 month visit. So the top line data is shown here in green is PBM and yellow is the sham. And you see an increase in best corrected visual acuity letter score throughout baseline to month 13. At month 13, this was statistically significant from the sham treatment and the p-value of 0 0.02 uh, at month 13. The first of the secondary measures was within group. And from baseline to month 13, we saw an increase in consistent improvement in letter score with a five and a half letter gain at around month 13. And that was significant almost uh, throughout the whole study starting at month one after the first round of treatment. We look at that a little bit more carefully and look at the distribution of those patients. We see a significant number of patients that gained from five to nine letters, 10 to 14, even some that had 15 and 20 letter improvements. There was clearly a shift in improvement of BCVA letter score with the PBM versus the sham treatment. In fact, about twice as many patients lost letters that were treated with sham versus those that had PBM treatment. So a clear shift into the BC letter improvement side. Looking at the responder distribution, we can see that over 55% of the PBM treated eyes responded with at least a five letter gain 
And that group had a mean of 9.7 letters. So that's these four groups in green here that had greater than or equal to five letter gains. Just as importantly, about 26% or a quarter or more of the patients got at least a 10 letter gain in these three groups with a mean letter gain of 12.8 letters. And even a small but significant portion, 5.5% of the patients got anywhere from 15 to 20 letters. So clearly a significant shift to improvement in BCV letter score with routine uh, treatments every four months with the Valeda light delivery system. <clears throat> the flip side of that, looking at letter loss, we saw more patients that had letter loss in the sham group than in the PBM group. There was one patient that lost 20 letters, but it was a pre-diagnosed cataract patient that saw worsening of the cataract through the treatment. And we'll do a further analysis without those cataract patients um, uh, during the study. To put this into perspective, <clears throat> two of the largest studies that looked at GA progression in dry MD were the lamplazibamod studies by Novartis. And those studies were each around 900 patients, the Chroma and Spectry trials. They each had around 300 sham patients. And the take home message from this study is while the complement inhibitor did not work, there was a significant risk for letter loss. In fact, in the 48 week trial, there was almost a five letter loss in the control arms for both of these studies. In contrast, you can look at the PBM treatment. These patients are intermediate. They have vision that's a better than uh, 2040. In the, the uh, Chrome and Spectre trial, these patients did have either unilateral or bilateral GA, but typically these patients greater than 60% have better than 2050 vision. And so what you see is that treating the patients prior to getting GA, where you have a slippery slope and a loss of vision, can really help improve vision and restore some of the early vision losses. And I think this is critical because it indicates how important it is to treat early before you get to GA, where you have now scar tissue and you've lost permanently a uh, visual function. So in summary, we saw patients with intermediate dry MD showed a one-year decline of about 1.6 letters in other trials. In several studies that look at GA, you can see significant loss in the early uh, onset of GA, about five and a half letters in one study. And other studies show that 67% of the patients lose their ability to drive in less than two years if they have visual acuity and the better seeing eye, but have GA. And a subset of those patients showed that the better vision eye actually loses vision quicker. And so what we're talking about here is an ability to treat patients early on uh, before we get to that point where you have geographic atrophy. In terms of anatomical benefits, we've seen in other studies reductions in drusen volume in later stage patients. In the light site two and the light site three in intermediate patients, the amount of drusen is smaller, but we still see an increase in drusen over time in the sham where virtually no drusen deposition is seen at baseline to month 13 in the PBM treatment groups. And this was confirmed in the light site three study with what we saw in light site two or European study. And as you can see by about one year, the differences are becoming markedly different between the drusen deposition in these patients. The safety of the product has been very uh, positive, a very safe profile in all of our previous clinical trials. In this study, the 13 month uh, safety data shows really no significant changes in ocular adverse events. <clears throat> we also have the non-study eye as well. And it shows a very comparable, if not better profile than in the non-study eye. Again, additional general orders and administrative site conditions, infects, infestations, infections, really showed a very clean profile for PBM and the sham treatment group in the study. So overall in summary for the light site three, we got a very significant improvement in BCVA at the month 13 with a p-value of 0 0.02. More importantly, the BCVA improvement showed a significant number of patients, over half the patients gained five or more letters and over 26% of the patients gained 
10 or more letters with a mean of about 12.8 letters. We did not see any difference in a low level BCVA or Mars contrast sensitivity, but these patients have pretty good vision to begin with. And talking to some of our retinal experts, uh, low level BCVA doesn't track with the early intermediate patients. <clears throat> we do see a numerical increase in Drusen deposition in the sham with no change in Drusen deposition in the PBM and a significant correlation was seen between BCVA and Drusen volume. And finally, an excellent safety profile in light site three, uh, which is consistent with what we've seen in previous trials. So I'm very happy to see that we're, we're uh, getting through the uh, light site three trial. I just also wanna add to that a couple slides on the electrolyte study, which we completed about six months ago and is being written up for publication. This was a study where we added a biomarker, uh, ERG or electroretinogram, and we looked at during the course of one round of treatment and then through six months of follow-up, was there a change in, in the retinal output during the course of PBM treatments? <clears throat> we also looked at standard imaging and uh, standard BCVA and contrast sensitivity measurements. Similar in terms of age and five years from diagnosis, the outcomes very briefly, we did see a significant improvement in ERG function in the multiluminance protocol as well as others. We saw about a 12 letter BCVA improvement, an improvement in contrast sensitivity at all three distances and Drusen reduction select patients with no AEs. <clears throat> to look at it a little closer, this is the core of the uh, study. We measured baseline ERG and then following the first, second, and third week of treatments where the patients were treated Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And what we saw was an increase over time in the magnitude of ERG response using a multiluminance protocol. This showed that over the course of three weeks, most of the patients showed an improvement in retinal uh, function. In fact, about 50% of the patients maxed around two weeks and it indicated we may be able to use ERG as a functional vision biomarker to not only optimize the number of treatments for the patient, but also as this returns to baseline to identify when the patients need to be retreated. Here's an example of the printout from the diopsis uh, uh, ERG devices. You get both the magnitude and phase and you get a quadrant diagram that shows the patients had impaired vision. Normal patients would be over in the right lower quadrant. And you can see after three weeks of treatment, we saw a nice increase on the ODI in both magnitude and phase from baseline and a nice increase in magnitude in the OSI. The phase did not change much, but started out around 90 uh, 6% and went up to about 98%. And importantly, you can see the improvement now in vision in both eyes into the normal vision quadrant. And so this printout is done without about a five minute protocol that shows you that the ERG was successfully taken and gives you the increase over multiple fluence, luminous um, studies over the course of about five minutes. So in summary, we've now got four studies that are pretty much completed or at least have gone through their month 13. The safety data has been excellent in all these studies. The efficacy has been consistent as we've been continuing to build the uh, clinical database. We've been very happy with the improvement both in their clinical studies, but the fact that uh, our commercial use is matching the results we see in our clinical studies. And so just to point out some of the pathological changes, we do see Drusen pathology. This is a patient from the light site one that showed remarkable reductions in Drusen after one year and two rounds of treatment at six month intervals. There's still a little Drusen here, but you can see a nice concave central macula. And this patient improved in both BCVA and contrast sensitivity. Likewise, some of our doctors in Europe now have looked at other maculopathies. This is a retinal epithelial detachment with significant edema and significant vision loss. And after three weeks, we see a nice improvement in absorption of the edema and the 23 letter gain was seen in this case study. So we are seeing the expansion in the other acute uh, injury, inflammation, inflammatory type of, of in injuries. 
Also, uh, similar to what you saw in light site uh, three, we are seeing drusen deposited over time. This is a light site two data, which really showed no significant drusen deposition in the PBM arm or in the sham arm. We see drusen continue to accumulate in the pathology. And likewise, looking at gen general um, uh, atrophy or geographic atrophy, we do see an overall decline in the growth of the GA lesion. If we do a least uh, square, um, square roots analysis of that, you can see that the patient numbers are small in this intermediate study, but they're consistent with what's been seen in the Oaks and Derby study by Apellus in terms of the reduction in GA lesion growth. And so with future studies, we hope to continue to show uh, long-term disease modifying benefits. And so with that, I'd like to stop and turn it over to um, uh, Yoigen so she can provide some of her case study experience. So Yoigen, would you like to take over? Thank you so much, uh, Clark, uh, for an always interesting uh, presentation. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you some of my own experiences. Um, before I start, um, are there any in the audience that... Um, uh, that uh, would like me to continue in English, uh, or could I switch to Norwegian? If you if you are not uh, Scandinavian speaking, uh, it will be good if you can just uh, uh, say so, so that we are including everybody in the, in the next session. So if I'm not hearing anything uh, or seeing anything in the chat, I will. Uh, switch to Norwegian uh, because I'm a little bit freer in that language, uh, but feel, feel free to, uh, to uh, just tell me if not. Så da går jeg over til norsk, og dette her er det et bilde av en av de første pasientene våre som vi fikk gjort vår leda behandling på, og akkurat som Clark har fortalt oss, så er dette en ganske enkel behandling å administrere både for den som gjør det og for pasientene å ta imot lavrisikobehandling uten noe ubehag forbundet ved seg. Så next slide, please. Og dette er et bilde av klinikken vår, Øyehelseklinikken, som er lokalisert i Oslo, og en av fordelene kan man kanskje si ved å jobbe her i klinisk praksis, hvor vi ikke har noe offentlig støtte, er at vi har jo en mulighet til å tilby behandling som foreløpig ikke er innenfor det offentlige. Og det var derfor vi hadde mulighet til å være såpass tidlig ute med Valeda, som er godkjent av EMA og legemiddelverket, men foreløpig ikke en del av det offentlige helsetilbudet. Ja, next slide, Clark. Og når vi skal vurdere disse pasientene, så kommer de til oss fordi de har fått høre om oss, enten via media eller blindforbundet, og de fleste av pasientene våre har to ting felles. Det ene er at de har kjent AMD, og det andre er at de har familiemedlemmer som har fått veldig dårlig syn på grunn av AMD. Så de er selv bekymret og har sett det på nært hold hvor synsvekkende denne diagnosen kan være. Og når vi først tar dem inn, så er det til en første screening hvor vi gjør bildediagnostikk og tar visus og vurderer om dette kan være noe for dem eller ikke, og informerer dem om alle forhold ved behandlingen. Og da jeg først startet med det, så tenkte jeg at dette skulle nok bli en behandling som var interessant nettopp fordi at den kunne gi bedre syn, at vi skulle behandle pasienter som strevde med synet på grunn av tørr AMD. Og for noen så er det sånn, det er noen som kommer inn med begynne synsforstyrrelser, som for eksempel at bokstavene hopper og danser når de leser, eller at de har litt problemer med dagliglivet og daglige funksjoner, og som merker en bedring etter behandling. Men som vi så på resultatene fra LightSight-studiene som Clark presenterte, så er det 
ofta ganska små ändringar i visus. Det är er någon som har stora ändringar, men ofta är er det små. så det är er en del historier som folk berättar oss om att de, de kan se för exempel klarare text på TV eller var en som så ett landemärke på den andra sidan fjorden som de ikke har sett på många eh, år en campingplats eh, eller det kan vara folk som synes att flaggstången har blivit rättare men väldigt ofta så ser de att ja det är er lite i tvivel kanske lite klarare eller de märker ingen skill. Så jag har gått mer och mer över till att tänka på detta som en förebyggande behandling, en behandling och vi kan eh, försöka och få drusen till att gå ned eller stabilisera situationen slik att de slipper att utveckla geografisk atrofi och slipper att utveckla sen AMD. Ehm eh, och så tidigt i förloppet när vi startat upp så gjorde vi bara en sån liten uformell eh, genomgång av några av våra data och det är er det vi ser här. Vi ser att vi har gjort en OCT scan som vi alltid gör med eye tracking så att vi får sammanligna på akkurat samma sted på nätthinnan för och efter behandling. Eh, og då kan vi få ett ganska gott intryck av hvorvidt drusen är er stabil i störelse eller går ned eller upp. Eh, og och så gör vi logmar visus. Det har jag inte tagit med här men det gör vi alltid. Så next slide Clark. Och här ser det eh, lite av eh, talmaterial som vi hade den gången eh, som cirka eh, mellan 8 och 20 patienter månedlig. Nu har vi nog gått lite upp till mellan 20 och 30 månedlig. Och sedan denna behandlingen utifrån protokollen så långt ska genta svart halvår så har vi flera nu som har fått eh, flera behandlingar. Eh, och eh, nu har vi kommit ända lite längre så att vi har en del som är er på en sjätte runda med Valeda. Next slide. Och eh, då vi gick igenom här eh, för eh, behandling och cirka en månad efter behandling så så vi att på eh, de som hade en, en säker reduktion i drusestörelse var på cirka 63 procent. Eh, och så var det någon som inte hade någon ändring eh, som var uändrat och det var på cirka 37 procent. Och så vet vi också att det, detta med drusestörelse eh, se effekten på uh, av Valeda virker med en gång men uh, detta är er lite långsamma processer uh, när man får stimulerat uh, fotoreceptorerna som kan synna bli bättre med en gång men när vi stimulerar pigmentepitelcellerna till att uh, förhoppningsvis fjärna avfallsstoff bättre så kan det ta ända någon månader så det är er väldigt ofta att vi uh, ikke ser effekt för det har gått som 3 till 5 månader så detta tal är er nog kanske i realiteten lite högre är er min erfaring. Det er også en del hvor vi ikke ser noen endring. Det er veldig få hvor vi ser forverring. Next slide. Så nå skal jeg gå litt over til case report. Og jeg har fire stykker, og jeg har, her har jeg egentlig fokusert nettopp på det vi snakker om. Eh, anatomiske endringer og eh, mulig forebyggende effekt og mulig be, eh, synsbevarende effekt eh, framför akkurat den synsbedringen. Detta är er en dame født i 39 som eh, har som ni ser på högra ögat en våt AMD med blödningar och ödem eh, och på vänstra ögat en torr AMD. Och vid baseline så var visus på högra ögat 0,25 en decimalvisus detta här och på vänstra ögat 0,63. Eh, och eh, denna patienten hade ju ingen stora synsproblem i det dagliga och den var nyupptagen den måte så hon gick och fick anti VGF behandling på sjukhuset. next slide. Och detta är er det vänstra det var det som var egna för valeda behandling och självfølgelig är er väldigt viktigt att ikke den valeda behandlingen kommer i konflikt med den jättegott dokumenterade viktiga anti VGF behandlingen hon fick på sjukhuset men det fick vi fint till. Så här ser dere hvordan det går eh, fra överste bilde som är er baseline till det nederste bilde som är er, eh, fra oktober 21. Och så ser dere visusangivelsen for hver eh, follow-up eh, til venstre. Og dere ser att visus håller sig stabilt på 0,63. Og så ser dere eh, i netthinnene så at de her drusnoide peddene går eh, gradvis ned 
og drusestørrelsene går gradvis ned. Og vel å merke, ikke på bekostning av, eller det er ikke fordi at det blir økende geografisk atrofi. Vi kan se litt tegn til sånn inkomplett atrofi, sånn yrora, på siden av fobia. Men det har vi litt, muligens litt tegn til allerede fra starten av. Men i sentrum så er er det bevart, og i all hovedsak er ikke dette noe veldig stort preg av geografisk atrofi. Det er klart at hvis drusen hadde gått ned, men var blitt erstattet av geografisk atrofi, så ville jo pasienten ha progredert, og det hadde vært en uttrykk for en forverring, men det er det altså ikke her. Ja, så next slide. Så for denne pasienten så ser vi at over tid så har det er en god effekt denne behandlingen, og dette er ganske viktig for henne fordi at hun har våt AMD i det høyre øyet og er en skikkelig høyrisikopasient for å få dårlig syn på begge øynene. Det vanlige forløpet for disse pasientene er jo at de blir verre og ikke bedre. Next slide. Så dette er kasuistikk nummer to. Det er en mann som er født i 1943 med kols. Han har vært røyker, men nå har han sluttet. Han sier at han ikke har noen synsproblemer. Det er litt overraskende med tanke på at desimalvisus er 0,32 på begge øynene. Vi ser på bilden at det er litt epiretinal fibrose, litt druser og litt pigmentforskyvninger. Next slide. Og her har vi OCT-bildet av hans høyre øye på toppen ved baseline og nederst etter to valeda behandlinger. Og til venstre så er det visusangivelse. Og denne pasienten har vært litt forsinket mellom første og andre valeda behandling. Vi ser at den første runden med ny behandlinger fikk han i februar 2021 og den siste i november 21, så det var godt ni måneder mellom de to. Og vi kan se på visus at det har blitt litt redusert til 0,25. Men vi ser på drusen at den har gått betydelig ned i størrelse, den sentrale drusen, uten at det har blitt noe atrofiutvikling. Next slide. Her er det venstre øye hans, det samme her med at visus har gått cirka en linje ned, og det er ganske uforandret her på dette bildet, min tolkning av det. Med litt sånne pedder og litt sånn uryddig, men ikke noe økende atrofi og ikke noe vekst av noen ruser. Next slide. Så her har vi også et eksempel på en pasient som hadde god effekt på druser, og så har han gått litt ned i visus, og det er kanskje fordi at det gikk litt lengre tid da. Slik som studiene viste at etter et halvår så var visus tilbake igjen på baseline, og da var det på tide å behandle på nytt for å få opp visus igjen. Men pasienten har jo ikke noe økende AMD, tvert imot en bedring i det anatomiske, så det er sannsynlig at når han får ny behandling igjen, så vil visus ta seg opp. Og kanskje er dette et hint om at hvis man bare tenker på forebygging og bare tenker på å få drusene ned i størrelse, så er det muligens mer stabile prosesser. Det er i hvert fall en hypotes fra min side av min kliniske magefølelse på det, siden jeg har en del pasienter som noen ganger må få litt forskyvning på de her intervallene. Next slide. Så kommer vi til den tredje og nest siste kasuistikken. Dette er en dame født i 56, og jeg bare tar henne med bare for å illustrere litt hvordan vi tenker, fordi hun her også kom inn og var veldig bekymret, hadde fått høre at hun hadde AMD og fått høre hvor alvorlig dette kunne være. Og så ser vi at hun har jo egentlig et perfekt makula på venstre side, og så en liten druse på høyre side. Next slide. Så har hun aldri røykt, og det var ingen i familien som hadde AMD. Så dette er en pasient som har utmerket prognose 
hun har bare mild larm det, og fem, ti års risiko på for at det skal bli dårlig syn på et øye er bare noen få prosent. Hvis vi ser på disse longitudinelle ARDS-studiene, så har vi gode data på det. Så hos henne så kunne vi jo berolige og si at det er selvfølgelig ikke galt å behandle, men det er kanskje ikke nødvendig heller. Og i den andre ytterligheten så har vi kanskje pasienter med veldig langt kommet geografisk atrofi, hvor det er ikke så mye hensikt i å behandle. Så det er disse med gruppa med intermediær AMD og familiehistorie som er de som vi stort sett behandler. Next slide. Den siste pasienten jeg vil trekke fram er en dame født i 44, ikke røyker, hun har reumatidartritt, og for å bedre plagen fra sin reumatidartritt så hadde hun 6-12 måneder før hun kom startet plakkenil 200 milligram. Og så underveis før hun kom så fikk hun stadig litt problemer med lesing og små bokstaver. Og så har hun en mor som også hadde reumatoidetritt og AMD, og hun beskriver det som at moren ble blind av AMD. Next slide. Og her ser vi bildene ved baseline. Vi ser at visus er ganske godt da. Men det er absolutt litt patologi i begge makler her. Next slide. Så bare litt repetisjon av plakkenil, klorokinfosfat, brukes for å behandle malaria og autoimmune sykdommer, sånn som systemisk lupus, erytomatosis og reumatoid artritt. Og har ofte få bivirkninger, kroppslige bivirkninger, men de krever at man følger med på øynene deres, for over lang tid så kan medikamentet akkumuleres i netthinnen og skape makulopati. Og denne pasienten hadde bare brukt medikamentet i et årstid, som er veldig lite i denne sammenheng, men hun hadde i utgangspunktet en AMD, og da skal man være oppmerksom på at dette er mye mer sårbare for forandringer. Så plakkenil bør som hovedregel unngås i pasienter som har AMD, og det synes jeg av og til at vi ser at de kanskje ikke tenker over, for dette AMD er så vanlig. Next slide. Så er det en annen ting, og det er at plakkenil også øker, virker fotosensibiliserende, så kan man bli lettere solbrent. Og det har vært en av de tingene som de har vært veldig nøye på i studiene, at pasienten skal ikke stå på fotosensibiliserende medisiner. For man vil jo for aller ikke skade nekken deres. Så... Vi kunne ikke starte Valeda med denne pasienten med en gang, men vi fikk henne av plakkenil i samarbeid med reumatologen. Hun fikk startet på et biologisk legemiddel i stedet for, og så fikk hun ARETS 2-supplement, sånn kosttilskudd. Og det vil jeg gjerne også trekke frem. Det er veldig vanlig bruk i USA, og så er vi ikke så flinke til å gjøre det i Norge og i Europa, og her har vi Cochrane gjennomgang på at dette er en forebyggende behandling som reduserer utgangspunktrisikoen med 25 prosent. Så hvis man kanskje har en femårs risiko for progresjon på 40 prosent, og så legger det ARS2, så er man enig i 30 prosent, som kan være veldig betydningsfull for mange pasienter. Og det er ganske høye doser, høyere doser enn det som som ofte står på pakken som man får kjøpt over disk, så man må tenke på det litt som et legemiddel og noen hensyn å ta i forhold til andre medikamenter de står på og en del sykdommer og ting man skal tenke på. Men det bør vi absolutt ta oss tida til å gjøre. Next slide. Så her er det høyre øye hennes. Ja, skal vi se, før og etter at hun fikk stoppet med plakkenil. Og dere ser, bare det har jo hatt, hvis vi kan tolke det sånn, en betydelig effekt på netthinnen hennes, på 
det den med reduktionen av drusnoide pedder. Next slide. Och det samma i vänster öga. Next slide. Och här har vi ehm alla bilderna så att det överst de två översta är det sett för på det högra ögat och så de två nedersta är fra hun fick startet var ledarbehandling för efter ett år så tog vi chansen på att göra det där för då tänkte vi att att hon att det läkemedel var ute av kroppen hennes och då kan man se en ytterligare nedgång av drusnoide pedder och drusne på sidan. Så og visus er bevart på 08 og hun har ikke lenger noe synsbesvær. And next slide. Og det samme her, de to nederste bildene er fra det venstre øyet hennes etter at hun fikk startet valedabehandling. Så denne pasienten føler vi at vi har kunnet hjelpe. Og ja, hun strekker litt at det er viktig å tenke litt helhetlig på disse pasientene da. And next slide. Ja, både at man må tenke på medikamenthistorie, eh, og at eh, vi skulle, man skal unngå valeda hvis det er fotosensibiliserende legemidler. En, en annen, eh, det er ikke så veldig mange av dem, men en annen viktig er amiodarone, som er sånn, eh, antiarytmikum, som en del pasienter står på, som kan både være nettinnetoksisk og eh, fotosensibiliserende. Det kan være vanskeligere å få pasientene av, da, for der er det ikke så mange alternativer. Um, ja. And next slide. Så här går jag lite mot slutet av eh, min session och eh, tror eh, eh, när det gäller ja, mina erfarenheter med valeda är att det är väldigt viktigt att sätta det lite in i en ram då, eh, at vi måste snacka med patienterna på förhand om förväntningarna både om studiene og om hva vi vet så langt, og snakke med dem om at kanskje den viktigste effekten er forebygging. Og selv om vi ser at synsbedring og disse druseendringene er relativt små, så er de veldig viktige, fordi det er et uttrykk for at nettidens funksjon bedres. Og ja, så er det jo fortsatt sånn at de studiene som vi har, flott gjennomførte studier med kontrollgruppe, placebo-gruppe, med høysignifikante effekter, men det vi mangler som blir veldig spennende å se er så langtidsstudiene, og i hvor stor grad vi kan hindre pasientene fra å progredere fra intermediært til sen AMD, i hvor stor grad vi kan hindre dem i å få både våt AMD og geografisk atrofi, og særlig geografisk atrofi, tenker jeg da. Eh, og ja, eh, jeg bare synes at det har vært en fantastisk reise å få lov å følge disse pasientene, og få lov å være med eh, og ta i bruk denne behandlingen, og eh, jeg synes at vi må omfavne det som er som det er såpass seriøs forskning bak, selv om det er litt i tidlig fase, for dette er en stor gruppe med pasienter som ikke har hatt noe særlig tilbud til før. Så det var det jeg hadde tenkt å si. Så so I'm about to finish now, Clark. Så so I think we can open up for questions. Perfekt. That was great, Jørgen. And um, appreciate your uh, opportunity to hear about some of your case studies. So tell us. Yes, thank you very much for the excellent two presentations. There are some questions from the audience. Uh, let me summarize. Um, maybe, Clark, you can tell uh, the experience from the studies, or Dr. Olgen, you can tell about your personal experience. Uh, how do you talk to the patients in terms of apparent um, vision gain? and um, how do you communicate with the patients? And ad additionally, um, what, do you, uh, what do you promise them, promise in brackets them, and how you manage their expectations? And um, 
what is the percentage of patients who actually feel an improvement from your experience, Dr. Eugen? And maybe Clark, you can tell what is the number which we had in the studies. Sure. Uh, Jorgen, would you like to start or would you like me to start? Well, I, I can start uh, uh, very briefly and uh, I think it's a good question because that's uh, what very many patients, of course, uh, um, have on their mind when they enter the, the examination room. And uh, I usually try to take down the expectations when it comes to a visual uh, gain because uh, as we have been um, seeing, uh, the, perhaps the most important uh, uh, issue here is to prevent the drusen from progressing and uh, prevent uh, uh, vision to deteriorate. Um, because when, when the geographic atrophy is present, uh, then there is not so much uh, we can do anymore. Um, and uh, then quite a few patients uh, still report that they feel that their vision has improved. Uh, but uh, I try not to, to, um, uh, to exaggerate the, the effects because as we see in the studies, the, the effects are important and significant, but not uh, for most of the patient the majority, not very, very many letters. Yeah, I would just add to that is that let, let's step back and take a look at the disease because I think that's the important thing. It's a chronic degenerative disease. And I've spent about 30 plus years in chronic degenerative disease, particularly of Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's. And we learn, <clears throat> I think in Alzheimer's, that by the time you got plaques and tangles, you may be a little bit too late. Um, the similar pathology you see in retinal disease with deposits of lipoprotein <clears throat> which leads to multiple consequences. It leads to inflammatory response that can be detrimental to the surrounding tissue. It leads to ischemia. Um, and we know that the more drusen deposition, the larger amount of drusen deposition, the more likely you're able to progress either to later stage of vision loss or to wet form. So when you look at the overall disease, I don't think we should be promising vision improvements. We need to address the patient that the core disease, the end game for this disease is if we don't treat patients, you have the potential of losing vision. And so we wanna make the tissue healthier. And that means lifestyle changes. It means maybe vitamins as well and other uh, treatments that are available. Unfortunately for these patients, there are no uh, easy uh, treatments and there's probably never going to be a magic bullet or one drug that's going to cure this disease. So what we have is a, a targeted approach around mitochondria, which is involved in a lot of these diseases. It does appear in our studies, um, in multiple studies that can have improvements in BCVA. Depending on where your starting vision is, we get improvements in contrast sensitivity. We've seen quantitative improvements in fixation stability and uh, microperimetry endpoints. Um, ERG provides us quantitative benefits in retinal ganglion function. But not all patients are going to show across the board those improvements. We get in the light site three, which is our biggest study, we probably get patients that at least get some letter benefits about 80%. 55% of those patients get over five letters, which is one line. And that mean that group is almost two lines. So there is room in those early patients where you have failing tissue, but it's still viable that you can treat. Once you get to geographic atrophy, that's a scar that we can't fix. And so there is a continuum. The earlier we treat, the better vision you have, you're not going to get 10 to 15 letters. And the later stage patients, if you don't have viable tissue and you've lost significant vision, you're not going to be able to restore that. So it really is a difficult disease that we have very limited options. And I think we have to understand that we have to treat the disease from the beginning to the end. And if we treat earlier, you have the best opportunity to provide you know, valuable vision for that patient through the course of their life. So that, that's the way, uh, personally, I look at it from a scientific standpoint. Um, it's 
complicated, obviously, when a patient comes in and is desperate and is losing vision, but you may have to have a different conversation with them. It's maybe keeping what you have. I think, Eugen, you, you can tend to do that is, is from our discussions previously as well. Yes, I, I fully agree. Uh, and, and, but then once in a while, uh, we get uh, some really wonderful stories from patients that actually gain vision as well and, and get uh, 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 not only on the vision board, but also uh, changes their uh, quality of life. Like people that are becoming more uh, independent, uh, like they have taking up hobbies or they are like hunting or golfing or they have been able to uh, uh, walk in the forest uh, again, stuff like that. Uh, so so uh, not, uh, uh, um, there are quite a few of them as well, but the, for the majority, the effects on vision are significant but small. Yeah, and I would, I would tend to uh, say that we've seen that in our Light Sight 1 study where we cast a wide net uh, from 2040 to 2200 uh, patients uh, coming into the study. About 65% uh, or more were at ARIDS category four. So they had significant GA. Um, only about 25% of those responded really well and it correlated with GA in your central fovea. Um, the ones that did better were those earlier patients that didn't have central GA, and consequently, that's why we've moved to earlier studies. But those 25%, sometimes you'll get a case where they'll have viable tissue, and you would think, yeah, I, it's probably not a case for PBM, but they show some remarkable benefits. So because a disease is pocketed with different areas of viable versus geographic atrophy, it's hard to determine except on an individual case, whether that patient is gonna respond um, you know, with, with better vision after treatment. <clears throat> That's my experience too. I, I usually when I see center involving geographic atrophy, I recommend them to, to spend their money on, on something more pleasant than treatment that probably not will help them. But then I have patients that uh, uh, say that they would like to try anyway and I never refuse them because uh, there are some uh, case reports that are quite astonishing and uh, when it comes to uh, people with a uh, poor vision it's it can be sometimes hard to measure uh, the improvement uh, but when you talk to them they they can uh, have quite uh, remarkable stories so um, yeah I agree okay Thank you both for the interesting feedback. Another practical question is, how often is the best to treat the uh, patients, okay? Um, the feedback is that we recommend six months, but um, there are some other indications from light side two or three. And um, direct question is, one times per year is too little. So what are our recommendations and what is your experience, Dr. Oregon? Well, uh, uh, Clark uh, is probably the best to, to uh, recommend here, but uh, the protocol says every six months. And yeah. then we know that there has been uh, one of the light size studies try to see if there could be a beneficial effect of, of hormone treatment uh, so that the patient did not go down to baseline visual acuity again. So I think for vision, it could be a good idea to treat a little often, more often. But my yeah. clinical gut feeling is that when it comes to the Drusen reduction and to just stabilize, uh, uh, then uh, six months is enough. And maybe for some patients, even a little longer, but I think one year is too long. Yeah, I think one of the, the complexities of this is that this is a therapy. So there are going to be patients that are going to show remission and you could design any number of different trials. What we've tried to do is take it as a stepwise fashion. And the very earliest, our two founders, they did uh, treatment for six weeks and just followed the patients and they did see remission. And um, even though some of the patients were better off at the end of one year, it probably was 
indicated it was not enough to do just one round of treatment. We condensed that to three weeks by increasing the uh, or doubling the, the dose or fluence. And in our first study at looking at retreatment, we went to six months. And we did see about 20% of those patients remissed. And then when we hit the patients again at six months, they came back up, those that had lost. And then at one year, they were starting to remiss again. So um, when we analyzed that in terms of where they were in stage of disease, it was very clear that there were patients that did pretty well that had intermediate and other patients that had GA didn't do as well. We felt that in the European multicenter and in the US trial, we would move them in a little bit earlier every four months to see if we could get a sustained benefit. And in light site two and three, that's exactly what we've seen. We've seen a sustained benefit with a little bit shorter interval. However, we did in between that another study looking at electroretinogram. And in those were again, intermediate patients. So we're all, those three studies are all a little bit earlier, better viable tissue in those patients about five years after diagnosis. And what we found in the uh, electroretinogram where we just treated them once and followed them, they still had good vision at six months. So again, it goes to the complexity of the disease. It may be that those later patients maybe they are the ones that would require more treatments because their benefit may not last as long. We can only speculate at this point. So part of adding imaging and biomarkers like electroretinogram provides you with those independent quantitative measures to help optimize the treatment for your patient. And while imaging is great, it still is fairly static. It takes a while for drusen to, to resolve or to change. ERG you can do in a fairly short period of time within a few minutes and generate some quantitative data. And what we've seen is that that may track with the number of treatments and potentially when it's starting to diminish and when you need to retreat. So I am a, a big believer in ag agnostic quite honestly, to using imaging and, and microperimetry and ERG to help define and optimize the treatments for your patients. So we're starting to say four to six months, use what other tools you have. And we've even seen an ERG that one patient, one eye maximized at two weeks, the other one took three weeks. So even within the patient, Typically, the disease is not equal in each eye. One is usually further along. So realistically, you have to look at this as a, as a, a treatment around a chronic disease, and it may change during the course or stage of disease the patient's at. Does that make sense? Yes. Maybe we will have several protocols in the future, like treat and extend <clears throat> and pro PRN, prorenata, and... and, and if we, if we think of it. I, I think that's, a, I think you're spot on. I think like any therapy that comes on, it evolves over time with more research. And so you're going to find additional um, opportunities um, uh, when you're treating these patients and how to treat them. Yeah. Okay, um, was very interesting from both of you. And it's, Sometimes amazing when something gets interesting, the time is flying, yes. We have already covered one hour. Uh, we would like to thank for the two speakers for the excellent presentations and for the active participation. So should you have any further questions in the future, please do not uh, hesitate to reach out to us. Here you have our contact details. So finally, we would like to wish you a nice evening and above all, we still have Corona uh, around the corner. Stay healthy. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Till. Thank you, Jürgen. Thank you, Clark. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.